In this episode, I host part four of an ongoing dialogue between Shin Zen Young, meditation teacher and neuroscience research consultant, and Chelsea Fasano, a Columbia University neuroscience student. But now the dialogue has become a trialogue, as we have the great pleasure of being joined by Dr. J. Sanguinetti. Dr. J. Sanguinetti is the Assistant Director for the Center for Consciousness Studies and Research Assistant Professor at the University of New Mexico, where he directs the NICE Lab, the Non-Invasive Cognitive Enhancement Lab, and SEMA, the Sonication Enhanced Mindful Awareness Lab, in collaboration with Shenzhen. In this fascinating episode, we discuss topics such as what is pleasure, enlightenment as Fristonian free energy, the relationship between predictive coding and the nature of suffering, bliss and orgasm, Shinzen's daily mystical experiences, and more. So without further ado, Shinzen Young, Chelsea Fasano, and Dr. J. Sanguinetti. Shinzen and Chelsea, welcome back to the podcast. And I'm so delighted that we're also joined by Dr. J. Sanguinetti. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Yes, so exciting. In our last episode in this dialogue series, we ranged across topics such as gamma brain waves and the possibility of similarities between orgasm, epilepsy, and mystical experience. And we talked about what a training in tolerating severe pain might indicate about the nature of concepts such as hedonic valence, vedana, equanimity, and perhaps even the notion of enlightenment itself. So I'm so excited about this, this conversation and what a lineup we have and I want to thank all three of you for making the time to to come here and have this have this discussion this trialogue I suppose it is uh, so let's not waste any more time uh, Chelsea please so just to introduce the podcast or start us off in some place and then we can go wherever we want to go um, last podcast we did end on this idea that it's possible that widespread synchrony and binding between uh non-local regions of the brain could be contributing to states that feel very blissful or states that uh, correspond to a subjective experience of oneness, feeling of oneness with everything. And then Dr. Sanguinetti brought to my attention last night this um, symmetry theory of valence, which talks about how consonance, dissonance, and noise uh, might be the three components that kind of contribute to positive valence or to bliss. And it, it really was very interesting to me because it reminded me of one of my conversations with Dr. Barry Kamizaruk, who's a sexual scientist. And he teaches um, about pleasure and pain at Rutgers. And he actually has told me that there's not a totally clear scientific consensus on what pleasure actually is in the brain, which is very interesting to me. And one of the theories that he told me um, when we were speaking is that um, it came from some of his experiments with rats. And he noticed that as they went towards a reward system, a, a reward itself, that they were getting a uh, release of positive neurotransmitters. But he actually noticed that he couldn't differentiate if it was the reward that was causing the pleasure or if it was the going towards the thing that was causing the pleasure. So he actually thinks that what might be the difference between pleasure and pain is whether we're turning towards or approaching or wanting something or whether we're not. In other words, it's not actually the experience of the thing that's causing the pleasure, it's our stance towards the thing. And this really uh, goes with this theory that you introduced me to Dr. Sanguinetti because in order for us to become sort of saturated with any given experience enough that we could get this widespread synchrony, we would have to affectively turn towards the experience. So I wanted to get your take, um, Dr. Sanguinetti, on all of this in Shenzhen about bliss, positive valence, widespread synchrony, and wanting an approach behavior and how you think this all works together. Sure. Um, first, I just want to say it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, part of this conversation, I listened to all three parts of the uh, Guru Viking takeover um, over the weekend, and I am just, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this conversation. And I wanted to say too, I reflected this to Steve, that I think this podcast is really special in creating the space for these types of conversations. Uh, as you guys have been saying on this podcast, these are really important conversations, and it's great to have the space to let the ideas unfold and cultivate them. So thank you. 
Um, okay, boy, you started with the biggest question, what is pleasure? <laughs> Uh, that is an unanswered question, as you said, in neuroscience. And there's a lot of different theories that um, very much like consciousness um, or what, what is laughter or why do we have orgasms? Uh, these are questions that are so big that the, the dueling theories don't even agree on the assumptions uh, about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to start there. Um, also, when we talk about gamma synchrony and things like that as well, uh, the science is so new that we, we can't even agree on the basic assumptions of what we're talking about. Oh, I'm so relieved um, that you say that. It's not just me that doesn't know the answer. <laughs> right. You know, I, I think it's, it's to have the context, too, that, you know, the contemplative neurosciences, which is what we've been talking about here, uh, they're in their infancy, but so is neuroscience in general. Uh, the, you know, we're going to look back in 500 years, and, and the way that we're talking about things right now are going to seem elementary compared to what we'll know about the brain then. So just to put that in context, we know very little uh, about the, the concepts that we're even bringing up, which to me makes it a lot of fun as you know, this is the young science where we get to, to really, you know, pick, pick the fruits and, and, you know, it's going to blossom into to really beautiful science. Um, for pleasure, yeah, what you were bringing up is the idea of approach versus withdrawal. Um, so there's a basic system in almost all of animals that motivates them to approach towards a mate or food or something novel. Um, and there's another mechanism that makes you withdraw to save yourself. Um, so there's these two basic valence dimensions, if you want to think of them that way. And there's uh, systems in the brain that have evolved to help us do this approach versus withdrawal. Um, so what you were talking about with pleasure is wrapped into that approach. Um, or withdraw. You can take pleasure from withdrawing as well. Uh, but those basic systems with, with basal ganglia and the dopamine systems are helping us to learn when should we approach something uh, like a mate uh, and when should we recoil. So, you know, if you're a praying mantis, so the mate doesn't eat you, um, for example. Um, however, within that, we don't really know why uh, pleasure is emerging. Mm -hmm. And that gets into that, that theory that we were, we were just discussing. So the symmetry theory of valence, which I can bring up if you're interested. Could yeah. you go into that for a sec? Sure. Um, so this is a new theory to me too. So I'm not an expert in this by any means. Who, who's um, behind it? These are my new friends at the Qualia Research Institute. Um, Q-U-A-L-I-A, -A, Qualia Research Institute. And they have set out to form a theory of what valence is. What does it mean to have positive emotion? And the idea is instead of solving the hard problem, which is what is consciousness and how does it emerge from the brain? Why don't we solve the uh, almost as hard, but not quite as hard problem, which is what is pleasure and how does pleasure emerge from the brain? If you can solve that problem, then you can treat things like depression, anxiety, you can understand why, uh, for example, when you reach these um, unusual states in meditation or with psychedelics, why does it feel so uh, you know, unifying and mystical, for example? So it's this sort of spectrum theory of emotion. And the basic idea is something like this. If you imagine each experience is like a shape, if you could apply some geometry, some ge geometric math, for example, to the brain, to define the shape of every experience. So let's say the shape of my grandmother cooking a pecan pie. I'm from Mississippi and I love pecan pies, right? So I have an, an experience, I have a memory, I can bring this up in my head. That has a certain geometry to it. Every experience will have a different geometric form. The idea here is that the more pleasure you have, the more symmetric that geometry is. And symmetry is a very deep concept in both science and philosophy. And they're going as deep as you can go, I think, in this theory. But what they're saying is that the more symmetry the system has, uh, the more positive valence will emerge out of that system. Um, and we can, we can get into that. I'm, I'm not totally 100% familiar with the theory yet, but you know, that's the basic shape of this theory. And that predicts that when you look into the brain of someone on psychedelics, someone who's an advanced meditator, orgasm, um, any of these types of things, you're going to see a certain type of symmetry that defines that state. And um, is there some 
fundamental principle in math <clears throat> or natural science or some particular person's work that they uh, base this idea of symmetry on? Very good question. I haven't looked at the math yet, so I can't answer that question. Uh, well, but they have all of their papers are on their website, qriinstitute.com, so if people are interested. Yeah. And uh, who are they? Are, are they at a university or, uh, um, I mean, I've seen them and I've probably met them, but I don't really remember. Yeah, we, you and I met them um, one time when we were at this very beautiful house in the Bay Area that overlooked, I don't know if you remember this infinity pool where the water was falling off the side of the mountain and we could see this whole view of the city. Uh, so that's where we originally met these people. And um, they're mostly oh, PhD. Oh, I remember. I, yeah. We met, that was at the Mind uh, Summit? The Brain Mind Summit. Yeah. Brain Mind Summit. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, but remind me, who are they? <laughs> Sorry. So um, a bunch of, bunch of PhDs in neuroscience, math, philosophy, all of the above. So it's a group of, uh, looking at the website, at least 15 people or so. And wow. They have found some funding. So they're an independent institute who are collaborating with, in, with universities. And uh, they're really pushing the science and it's exciting. I think Chelsea looked at it last night and got super excited as well. Yeah. That's, well, and is their main thrust this notion of hedonics or pleasure? Yes. Well, I have a question I'm dying to ask, Jay, that I never had a chance. Since you brought up symmetry, I correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there a thing whereby uh, if you present a lot of different, say, faces and merge and average them, even though they're ordinary faces, the composite, if it's done with a Bayesian blur or what have you, uh, looks more beautiful than the normal person? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, that's true. Is that a true thing? And is that in any way related to the notion that I've heard that more symmetrical faces are more appealing, which brings in the symmetry and beauty. And this other thing brings in perhaps a Bayesian distribution of, you know, brings in uh, probability theory. Uh, yep. So, is there any tie between those things? I've always wondered. I, well, there's Shenzhen's brain making high level connections again. Yes, exactly uh, that those types of things are going on. So what you find is that the more you average a bunch of faces, so take a million faces from the United States, uh, the average face is usually perceived as more beautiful or more pleasing. And it has more symmetry specifically between the of the face and uh, the, the what of the I face wanna... the features the features so eyes feature are a symmetry feature, the nose is the feature yep so that's it's the geometry and the relationship between the features relative to symmetry now not to interrupt but i've just got to ask then the you probably are not old enough to know the art link letter show it was an early TV show, very early. Even I was young uh, when it was on. But I, unless this is a false memory, I remember him having a bunch of very young kids all singing um, the uh, Star Spangled Banner, I think, or my country, Tis of the... Um, and they sung it together and it was just stunning. And then he interviewed each individual kid and they were like, each one was off. Really a lot of errors. But somehow when you heard it together, it, yeah. was that a similar situation to the faces, an acoustic analog perhaps? Or am I just making this up? that this didn't even happen. That's a good question. I'm not sure. <laughs> OK, I, I'm sorry. I always wondered. And now I'll let you continue. 
Well, you know, what we do know is that the brain is averaging across the inputs. So it's averaging and it's integrating and averaging and integrating. And then it's making massive predictions. So when it has too much information comes in, coming in, like a bunch of people singing, and you have to also remember the information is, the sound is bouncing off the walls and averaging into the microphone. So all that information will be averaged together. And that's what you're getting in your brain. So again, if the brain likes this symmetry and simplicity, which I think are two principles that are probably functioning in the brain, then exactly, it might be presenting to you a much more symmetrical, simple input um, than, than what's actually coming in. And that's part of what I think these theories are trying to get at as well. They do say in the article that um, some of the way they're doing the math is actually being compared to music and fre harmonic frequencies of music. And I think that's part of why I love this um, paper is because I was a trained musician from when I was young. And they actually have pictures of um, their way that they co compute how much harmony there is in the brain is actually, uh, they're comparing it to musical notation. And then they're, in my mind, I was thinking sort of intuitively about this and um, looking at the way they're depicting harmony in the brain as a flowing pattern that saturates the brain and um, saying that in sleep and on psychedelics, uh, in meditative states, that you would get this sort of saturation quality and that what would happen kind of subjectively is you could almost think of this as sort of inputs coming in and rather than a bunch of inputs competing for space, you're gonna let, letting the input saturate the brain so that it kind of echoes around inside of the brain. And I was actually thinking about how this would affect, um, you know, perception of time and things of this nature as, as Shinzen talks about in the What is Mindfulness pamphlet. If you're, if you're approaching a stimuli with complete openness to it, right? So no viscosity, stimuli is saturating the brain, echoing around in the brain, and then there's no feeling that things are changing because there's this continuity, then time would sort of subjectively collapse as well, which is something that does happen to people where, or, or warp in different ways, because what we often think of or how we perceive time is differences across moments, right? And so it was kind of beautiful to see. And I think um, they also say that you, when you would perceive something maybe with symmetry in, in any modality, visual, auditory, um, or, or maybe even somatosensory, that your brain might be more likely to enter into these high pleasure states, um, which is comes back to what you just said, Shinzen. Although obviously our brain does do some computation before, you know, audit simulate doesn't just go straight from sense organs into the brain, it gets modified and configured, but there is some, there's some way in which it's possible that the outside symmetry is in training neural symmetry. Um, and I think the reason why this was so fascinating to me is because of the idea that you brought up Shinzen at the very end of the last podcast, where it could be that when we learn to affectively turn towards something, it could potentially change the subjective valence of that thing from negative to positive, which is what the spiritual traditions say, right? That if you could simply want every single moment with your entire being, that every single moment would just be a continuous orgasm, that you could, if you could turn completely towards reality as it presents. And <laughs> I was wondering if there's some way in which this mechanism could be sort of the neural equivalent or related to that idea about aversion and clinging, basically coming back to very simple fundamental spiritual principles about what is aversion and clinging and how does it take us away from pain and into pleasure? Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking this is the new tagline to sell meditation. <laughs> we prove scientifically that it's okay. equivalent to a continuous orgasm. <laughs> I mean, people do report that. Yeah, I'm glad I wasn't the one that said that first. <laughs> well, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger said that about the pump. Uh, it was better than sex, but then when he got married, he uh, withdrew it. 
<laughs> uh, I'd like to actually hear more of what Jay would have to say about that, because I, I tend to blabber. Uh, that's super, super fascinating point. Uh, two levels. The first one, what you're talking about with the uh, symmetry valence hypothesis. So the the idea of resonant vibrations, that's a fundamental notion in their theory. And I think <clears throat> there's very little done on that in neuroscience, but there are other people who were talking about um, <clears throat> resonant frequencies, harmonic frequencies, as ways to understand these fundamental problems that you brought up last time, which is how do neurons locally communicate globally? So how does a neuron in the visual cortex communicate with the hippocampus or the prefrontal, if it does at all? One of these ideas may be harmonics. You may be having harmonic fractal-like patterns or regular harmonic patterns that are emerging from the system. And this gets back to this idea of why is there more gamma synchrony in the brain of meditators on some types of psychedelics? It's increased, sometimes it's not. It may be that you're um, not so much more binding, but that you are calming the seas so more harmonics can emerge from the system, right? And if more harmonics can emerge from the system, you go from local processing to global. So local and global have less distinction if you want to think about it that way. So we well, can, now, we can come wouldn't, back. wouldn't mm -hmm. gamma binding or some other kind of uh, clot synchron synchrony, um, wouldn't that connect across regions? Or is that more just in local that you get that uh, li uh, alignment? I had always imagined that the gamma synchrony could connect arbitrary regions with specialties. So gamma is really great because it's local to global. Gamma is usually when a network is synchronizing and those networks can be over larger network spaces, um, but it's allowing local neurons to all synchronize, synchronize their activity within a network. Um, so it's a local we, we synchronizing of a global, of a larger network. How large can the network be? Can it be the whole brain? <laughs> well, this gets right back to what I was just talking about. It really depends on what, what are the neurons trying to do in the first place? What's their function at that moment in time? Uh, and you have to always keep in mind that neurons process different things at different moments in time. There's not one function for a brain region or neuron. So time is a really important factor here. Um, if you think about, let's see, the people at home won't see this, but I'll hold up a red uh, water bottle on the screen. Um, red is always a fun color for neuroscience and philosophy. So the question is, how does the brain know that the color red is part of this object? How does it map or bind the red information to the actual edges of this object and the full object? There's a bunch of neurons that are actively processing, this, but there's also the, the bottle there's also a bunch of neurons processing the background. How, does, how do the neurons know, the background neurons know that they're not processing the object? This is called figure ground. Uh, how does the brain know the figure versus the ground? This is what my dissertation was actually on. The way that they do that is somehow the neurons that are actually working on the red bottle are all firing together in big gamma, 40 hertz, 50 hertz, 60 hertz. Uh, the neurons that are firing for the background are firing at gamma, but out of phase. So they're all firing together, the background neurons, uh, at like 10% phase, right? These guys are firing at 100% or something like that. You can look at the phase alignment of these neurons. They're all firing at the same frequency, but just out of, out of phase. The waves are different. Um, and that's, that's what's going on. That's what gamma is helping us do. Um, Jay, I didn't quite catch what was in phase and what was out of phase. Uh, sure. uh, could you run through that again? Sure. Uh, I thought I heard you say uh, in the example of the bottle. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll hold up this. Uh, it's even trickier. It's a sure. different. <laughs> so <laughs> how does it know the difference between this and this? Uh, did I hear you correctly that 
there's one part that's uh, processing this, and there's another part that's processing this. And then I didn't quite get which was synchronized. Uh, was it locally? I, I didn't quite get what happens after sure. that. Sure. So Shenzhen, you just gave our brains a much harder problem, <clears throat> actually, <laughs> because you held up a white cup in front of a white background. That that's such a hard problem for a visual system. I can't I can't understate it. When you try to get a robot to parse out the figure from the white a white figure from a white background, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. But our brains do it effortlessly, and the reason they do that is because all the neurons that are processing the cup are firing in phase at gamma. Does that They're help? in phase at gamma. Hold yes. on a second. The cup. The cup neurons. Yeah. Uh, are in phase at gamma. That means that their phase angle is zero. It doesn't mean that they have constant, there's a vector of constant phase angles. It right. means they are completely aligned. Yep, all uh, the waves are lined up. So all those neurons are firing at 40 hertz. So look, the cup is, uh, is, uh, uh, they're in uh, phase and they're at, in this case, something in gamma between say 40 and 80 or something like that, 40 and 60. Mm -hmm. So uh, cycles per second. So uh, now what's happening in the back to the background processing? Uh, so those neurons are likely also firing at gamma in phase with themselves. But out, out, uh -huh. of phase, out of phase with the, all the neurons that are firing for the cup. This is why I thought that <laughs> that 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 this that some modification of this um, phase activity would underlie or co-vary with experiences where things that once seemed different from each other would seem similar. Uh, based on one of those studies I read by Ooh, you, Joseph Hovick, where he found that there's a decreased anti-correlation in meditators between normally anti-correlated networks. So normally interoceptive networks and extraoceptive networks have this phase difference that you describe where they're firing differently. And so when they're firing differently, there is perceived to be a subject object distinction or an inner outer distinction, right? It's, a, it's the neural equivalent of duality. But in meditators, the anti-correlation decreased. So that's where I started to think that the, this phase activity that you're talking about could in fact be kind of responsible for subject object distinctions in, in a way. Yep. Uh, and more that's than just- That's very you know, interesting. Yep, I think, I think you're onto something. So if you just reduce it back down to the visual system and just to catch any, anybody up who's lost here, you know, the, the basic idea is that the visual system has to uh, differentiate between figure and background. Just bring it right there, figure and background. It's a really hard problem for the visual system. Uh, and we've just only very recently taught robots and drones and things like that how to do it, how to do that, which becomes scary when they're looking for a target, but that's another conversation. So just figure and background, right? And that's a basic principle that the, fig the brain has figured out. It's likely using gamma to do that, but that's still debatable. Some people think it's not using gamma, just to be honest. Well, uh, could it, it be using other frequencies, but the same, it's just sure. a different, uh, it's just a different drum, but same basic. Uh, other and frequencies are, or other principles, it, it could be using these harmonic frequencies or other types of, of functions. But it, it, it seems pretty clear to me, at least, that gamma is involved with segregating and grouping, segregating and grouping, segregating and grouping. And it's doing that, it's got to do that across levels. You got to remember too, that the visual system has, the, the problems are multiplexed. There's multiple dimensions to these problems in the sense that the input to the visual system is flat, two-dimensional, right? The neurons are hitting the retina, that's a two-dimensional system. And somehow it goes from 2D to 3D plus time that we experience. And in the visual cortex, there's multiple levels where it's sort of pulling apart that 2D input, figuring out where's a figure, where's a background, where's a figure, where's a background. And then what it does is it starts putting it back together at higher and higher 
sort of levels. Mm -hmm. So my brain knows that this object, this is a red cup, a red uh, water bottle, is a figure, but it's also a figure part of my room. So the, the visual system is also mapping my room. Uh, I'm in my lab, which is on campus. I've got a bigger map, right? So you can keep zooming out and zooming out and zooming out. Uh, all the way to get to what you're talking about, Chelsea, which is I have a point of view within this whole scene. I'm looking like my self-consciousness is like right behind my eyeballs and I'm looking out right now. Uh, if, you, if you give me a psychedelic or if I go on a retreat, that might flatten as well or something else might happen to that point of view. But I'm just saying this, that if you just start at the figure and you think about the brain has to parse and separate, parse and separate all the way up to what you're talking about, the sense of self. And I think that it's probably similar mechanisms all the way up. It's turtles all the way down, turtles all the way up in, in terms of this mechanism. So I think you're onto something, whether it's gamma binding or, or gamma something else, you know, I, we don't know yet, but I think, I think you're right. It's that basic principle changing all the way up to the sense of self. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, and then I'll turn it over to Shinzen because I know he has other questions and I don't want to take over, but the question is for me that I started wondering is what you, you two talk about stickiness and reducing stickiness or equanimity and increasing equanimity. And so I guess what I started to wonder is what other neural mechanism might be causing this reduction in, uh, in anti-correlation. So there's something that's going on where in a retreat, right, we're doing something that's allowing for these neurons to reconfigure their phase locking activities. And what would that be? Is it the turning towards thing? Is it reduction in stickiness? Is it equanimity? And how would that sort of work neurologically is where I started to go next with it is what's the cause of, it, unless we're in just ingesting a psychedelic and then it's probably neurochemical mixed with placebo, but does that make sense? A couple things that come to my mind are one might look at it from two sides based on the fact that broadly around the world, the contemplative traditions tend to talk either about um, some sort of trained improvement and we go through a path or um, there's a primordial completeness and we simply discover that that's there. But clearly these are two sides to one uh, endeavor, and many teachers, like myself, will say it's like wave particle with light. Let's embrace the complementarity of those approaches. So part of it might be things that are actual retrainings of surf more surface things. And part of it might be somehow accessing a completeness or perfection that's always there anyway. So one might want to sort of look at both points of view. On one hand, we're doing something that's causing some part of the system I'm thinking of it as being later <laughs> to change. Uh, from another point of view, something that's all, always there, perhaps in the early processing, is informing the later levels. And that's when you get the view of primordial enlightenment versus enlightenment uh, as a new experience. So one way to think about it is, it's another version of top down, bottom up. Um, 
what's the role of the fact that it's already integrated <laughs> uh, play in this experience? Because as we're talking, and I'm asking myself, well, what is my experience when I, when we're done, I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to walk through the city of Tucson. Uh, and um, what will be my experience? Well, I'll either be thinking about science, in which case I'm just thinking and enjoying my walk, or I'm taking a break from that and taking a walk. Now, if I'm taking a walk, I'm not thinking about work. I'm taking a walk. My experience uh, will be that the outer world and the inner world arise simultaneously as one wave. And I'm going to say that that is not the result of cultivation. That was always there. They always first came up that way. Um, and um, uh, it's just like a just happening. It's an effortless, simultaneous efflux and reflux. Uh, uh, so it has, you can, I, the surface is vivid. It's like brocade but it's feather light and paper thin. So I know not to run in front of a car or something, but the experience is primarily colored by a sense of the two of them together, the outer see, hear, feel, and the inner see, hear, feel. Or if you wanted to say sight, sound, and then mind, body, that would be an another slightly different way to chop it up. But in any event, they were always arising as one wave, uh, having the flavor of just happeningness. The only difference is now I notice that. Um, so that makes me think that some sort, of, some sort of improvement between uh, you know, my surface sense of the, of the world and what the depths have been doing ever since I was in the womb, somehow, there's a communication now. And the surface knows exactly what to do to get out of the way of the source so that everything is just fine. Magic. Um, that sounds like an integrating wave. That, that sounds like, Chelsea, what you were describing. Not two waves, but one wave. And it does sound like something in phase, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so I wonder where that takes us. I'm going to hand it over to Jay. Quickly, it kind of reminds me of what Jay initially said about how it could be that it's not that these, not an increase in something, but rather a decrease in noise. So if there was a decrease in noise and a decrease in decoherence, then the natural harmony and the natural coherence that is in the system would be able to spread or be noticed. But I don't know. I'm very curious about what you think about this, Jay, beyond that. Yeah, well, that was a beautiful description, Shinzen. Thank you for that. Well, um, have you noticed anything like that for yourself in your own practice? That kind of integration through... <laughs> wave mechanics 
Oh yeah. <laughs> um, Inside, outside, like I'm saying. Oh, for, for sure. Um, especially, I, I did a 15-week meditation course back in 2018, where I actually did some of the ultrasound stimulation that Shenzhen and I are talking about. And the fundamental experience was a, a fuzziness between inner and outer in a way that replicated into vision and auditory and feel. I mean, all of these boundaries became fuzzier. And it, it seemed as just as you're describing, everything sort of lined up in these waves. I, I experienced them more as patterns, I suppose, than waves, but mm -hmm. it was just patterns among patterns among patterns among patterns. And uh, yeah, it seemed like the system just knew what to do in that time. Um, and then of course the solidity of Jay and, and all the stuff just sort of came back. But one of the experiences was that, that thinness. I almost experienced the world as like this hologram that was both thin, but much, there was more behind it. Uh, I don't know how to exactly describe this in language, but you know, what I was looking at was a projection of something else and that something else was like connected right back to me in, in a very, very, very deep sense, uh, which was then freeing. I just didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to grab onto stuff so much. I told my girlfriend that it felt like if I hit my head on a rock, it would be okay because the rock was thin and, <laughs> and, there was, and Jay was fuzzy. So <laughs> none of that really mattered. Um, but I say this because, you know, this gets back right back to what we were talking about with the visual system, trying to fix, it's trying to take an input like this object and fix it and make it solid and find the boundaries of the object so it can assign those boundaries to something. And what we do know for meditators is that it tends to make those boundaries fuzzier. So um, if I give you something like an object called a... a um, a bipartite display or you know the duck vase if anyone knows that where it's one line but you can perceive it as a duck or you can perceive it as a vase this is something that Wittgenstein the philosopher really liked to talk about uh like your brain in the study yeah. the visual illusions that we're working with the, in the sensory clarity right these are illusions and what the brain will do if you just stare at it um the brain will see the duck and if you stare long enough, about a second to three seconds for the average person, you'll see the vase. Then you'll see the duck. Then you see the vase. And so the brain is just assigning that figure or that line to one side and then the other. However, that's because there's all this processing up higher than the visual system that's coming down into the visual system, like attention and past experience and all of these things are coming back into the visual system to help you fix that object so you can perceive it, so you can act on it. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here is a lot of that top-down stuff is, it's not going away, but it's loosening its grip on the input. And by loosening its grip, the input just flow, flows more through the system. That's pretty much, you know, it's just coming in, it's going through, and then you can act on it. And what's really interesting about that is that gamma this gamma stuff that we're talking about is more feed forward. Uh, alpha is tending to be mm -hmm. feedback. So 10 Hertz is more of the feedback. Gamma is more of the feed forward. And so that's what I said. We don't, we want to be careful about saying gamma is about binding specifically because gamma is also telling us maybe there's just more, more bottom up information going through the system, which is, is being less fixed in a sense that it's just the system so i didn't right. know that alpha is but that is going to depend on the part of the brain or is that everywhere that alpha tends to be more that's more feedback that's coming from bottom to top and gamma mm -hmm. it's true in more, the visual system it's this is relatively new uh, data, so we're not clear if this is a general mechanism, but uh, at least in the visual system, and my intuition is, as I've been saying, these mechanisms are probably preserved for the brain because that's what evolution does to biology, just you get preservation of mechanism. And so I would say, you know, if you're focusing your attention in a way that's causing visual boundaries to increase, so there's less solidity in your visual system and you perceive, you know, the world as having this sort of thinness to it. I think that same mechanism is probably propagating all the way into 
the same parts of the brain that are extracting the sense of self and causing the sense of self to have this something like a solidity, like a visual object. Uh, it's probably similar mechanisms just across much bigger brain regions. And those have been my experiences as well, is if you tune in, you, you know, if you're five days on a retreat and you tune into the body, there's some fuzziness, um, you know, in, in the system that um, once you tune into it, it becomes like the world has that same sort of thinness and fuzziness to it as well. Uh, and then you tune into a visual object and then you have all this tracking that you can do. You can track very, very quickly. But at the same time, those objects that you're tracking are, they're not sticking as much. They're emerging and then going away and, and emerging and going away as well. So, you know, I think if you can do that all the way into the systems that are creating the self, the thing just doesn't stick as much and then it feels good. <laughs> the, the end result of all that is I'm not sticking to, you, you can think about anxiety as an object, an object that your body's creating for you to stick to, right? Or I'm not clinging to this negative Trump worry that I have about the things unraveling in the economy or whatever. Whatever's emerging in the system just comes and goes. And then you get some freedom um, from that. Now, I think what happens after that is exactly what you said, Chelsea, which I've never really thought about before. But then what is the system doing? Your system has evolved to act. You need to act. You need to go get food. You need to uh, find a mate. You know, you've got all these motivations that are in your genetics and in your biology. And the sense of self has evolved within that framework to help you survive to, to meet those needs. And so I think when you're causing that system to have fuzzy boundaries, and stabilizing that so it's functional, so you can still drive your car or something like that, then what you're left with is approach motivation because really what the system wants to do is go out in the world and explore, especially with our big brains, right? We wanna go, we, we love novelty, we wanna go. That, that's something that really is programmed in, in a sense, but the sense of self, the ego and all the negative emotions are there to protect us from doing that too much because uh, you don't want to get too close to the edge of the Grand Canyon. You'll fall in, right? So you need a system to say like, not too close, but go to the Grand Canyon because it will free your mind or, you know, whatever experience you have. So I think you're exactly right. I think if you can modulate the self system in a way to free it a little bit from itself and all the stuff that it, it creates to protect itself, then what you're left with is a system that's like sort of free to approach the world without a lot of that negative valence stuff. So yeah, that's very cool. You know, uh, what do uh, I'm, I can't help wonder what people at Qualia or elsewhere, for example, what Carl Friston, or we already know, actually, Stu likes, Stuart Hameroff likes to talk a lot. What these various people would say about the, the ultimate origin of positive, uh, of pleasure. Yeah, what is a positive hedonic experience that is, yeah, what, where does, where, what is the birth of, you know, the pleasure God, comma? Because <laughs> uh, I have an idea of what I'd like it to be <laughs> for a good theory, but, and I know we're sort of running out of time, but Jay, I'd be interested in what they say, what Stuart Hameroff, if people don't know, is a senior faculty that Jay and I work with here. He is very interested in this. Uh, I'd be interested in how you cut up that conceptual, uh, or a para how you'd cut up that paradigmatic pie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, yeah, Stuart uh, tends to argue that pleasure was there like even in the 
protozoa and pre you know dna creatures that were emerging in the <laughs> in the primordial soup um not not clear if that's the case but from a nervous system point of view pleasure is there to motivate you as i said to action i mean you know we know that there is a depressed state that an animal can in, enter into it's called learned helplessness if you shock a dog they did these horrible studies to dogs where they shocked them and eventually the animal gives up and just like with visual perception i mean the fact that animals get up and do things in the first place is an amazing feat of evolution to motivate a creature amongst a world that is trying to kill it or eat it or you could fall into the Grand Canyon if you're not paying attention, right? I mean, there's all these things that can happen to the creature. And the fact that we, within that situation, can even experience, you know, all the positive valence things that the animal can experience, you know, that that's where these emotions evolved. That's the context that these emotions evolved in the first is place. It, is, it, is it possible or could a case be made that as far as evolutionary engineering goes, the main problem is, in fact, to get us out of bed at all. Yeah, uh, to, act. to be I mean, interested action. in the world. Because I'm thinking curiosity. Some mindfulness teachers emphasize it. And I think rightly so. Um, and if you look at creatures, they explore their environments. It's pretty universal, right? Throughout the whole phylogenetic system. Um, and babies explore their environment. Now, one of the ways that I would put the change in perception. I tried to explain what a walk is if I'm not thinking about shit, just like anyone else. I might have a mystical kind of experience if you know I directed my attention towards that. Um, but if I were to ask myself, why do I like this? Um, I would say because the other way hurts, number one. And that's the ordinary way, the way I would be experiencing the world without 50 years of practice. Uh, that actually hurts. Even when it feels good, it hurts. But you don't notice. It's too subtle. Those surface pleasures are actually uncomfortable, mm -hmm. subtly. Um, so number one, it doesn't hurt like everything did until maybe 20 years ago, everything hurt, um, subtly. Uh, but the other thing is it's intrinsically pleasant. Mm -hmm. The just happeningness is intrinsically pleasant. And um, not because it's pleasant. It's not a pleasure pain thing, either in body, emotional body or physical. Um, it's its own thing. It's the flavor of just happeningness. But that can be modeled with free energy. Entropy. That's what spontaneity is. It's the free energy change. And therefore, I got to ask myself, in the end, the source of quote, pleasure, maybe is the just happeningness of the senses matching the just happeningness of the world, which is the magic of the infant. Because it seems to me like the adult in me 
likes this way of experiencing the world because it doesn't hurt anymore or not as much. But the, the positive side is I'm like I'm eight years old or maybe eight months old again. If I let go of the surface adult, I, this seems to me to be the way the world was when everything was magic and curious. So then the way I'd like the theory to go because it would be convenient for Fristonian physics is well, in the end, it's the just, just happeningness. And what I've been working towards, this gets back to some of your things, Chelsea, about um, methodology. I came up, gee, I haven't told you this. I came up with a word for that thing that Juliana and I are doing with the terminology. For now, I'm calling it um, a tuned semantics, tuned semantics. I'm trying to tune the, the meanings of the words that as many as possible and as much as possible, the standard vocabulary of unified mindfulness. I'm trying to get the words to be close, at least some of them, to what they would mean in Fristonian physics. And the centerpiece is that enlightenment and maybe even the pleasure itself would have its origin in uh, just happeningness. Ziran in Chinese, uh, rang, uh, rang Jung in Tibetan, um, Aprani Dhana in Sanskrit, and many, many, many other words in these languages refer to just happeningness. And that's for me in the visual, auditory, somatic, inner and outer, everything. All have that. So in this, this question, so the question would be, uh, Perhaps we can model the origin of um, what gets the animal interested in its environment to begin with. Um, well, the most natural way to do that would be it experiences the magic of the effortless in its own senses, which is the magic of pratitya samutpada or conditioned co-arising the whole network, you know, in the outer, so that we could use Friston to explain, model, uh, you know, describe, perhaps even predict um, motivation to explore the world in it, and the origin of pleasure and maybe enlightenment itself. Because if I had to say what, yeah, and Jay, do you know, I, I realized I at Buddhist Geeks asked the question, publicly is free energy perhaps what enlightenment is. I don't know if I subliminally picked that up from Friston or whether I just hit upon it and he has done the science for us. Um, but if in fact, that's what's at the center of ordinary human pleasures and of liberated consciousness, then Fristonian physics becomes the science of enlightenment. That's what I'm hoping for. Of course, 
you know what they say, saddest thing in the world is, or at least in science, is a beautiful theory spoiled by ugly facts. So I've got a lot of homework to do. Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, well, you've, you've now, like the last podcast, you have taken me into a realm that's way outside of my wheelhouse, wheelhouse as well. <laughs> um, but a, but a, a few comments come up. I don't know how much time we have left. Um, I wanted you to have the last word. Sure. So, you know, we, we didn't get into this much, but there is a current framework called predictive coding, uh, Bayesian inference, um, that uh, is, is, I think, in the right direction. It's probably not a full theory of how, how brain is functioning, but the basic idea is that the brain is learning from past experience and using that information to create a model. So the world that you're looking at right now in front of your computer is uh, a model that the world has created for you that is a prediction about what's coming in. So it's this prediction model that's being updated by the information coming in. So just two basic principles, prediction and update, prediction and update. And in predictive coding, the idea is that when the input doesn't match the prediction, you get an error. The brain has this big error code and it says, wait a minute, there's something wrong here, right? There's a pink elephant in the room and I'm definitely not predicting a pink elephant. It takes you a bit of time. You have to attend to the object. The visual system starts processing more and then more pink elephant information comes in. And then you get a you know, the brain starts saying, I think there's a pink elephant. And finally, you see the pink elephant. You know, there's some idea like that going on. Um, that same mechanism could also explain why uh, we, <laughs> you know, when you have chronic pain, for example, um, you can amplify that pain signal. Um, you can get more uncomfortable and that, that signal can increase in the system and you get sort of dissatisfied. You get this dissatisfaction. You get uncomfortable because the brain is trying to do one thing and then this input is coming in and there's a mismatch and there's all this discomfort in the system. Um, I think that, that those types of mechanisms, they've been very well understood within the visual system, but again, I think they propagate up to uh, the sense of self, pleasure and all these other systems where the more that the brain is trying to predict and fix the income, uh, the input, um, the more space, there is for discontinuity or mismatch. And the more mismatch you have, right, the more that the system can sort of oscillate off into its own dimensions. So um, let's take the example of someone with depression. The depressed brain is really typified by a negative bias. Their brain is predicting negativity. It's, it's making these hypotheses that the world is negative and awful and human beings are awful and there's all this sort of just stuff like that in the system. Um, what can happen in their brain is even when positive information comes in, the brain's not predicting that and therefore really not even seeing it. Um, so there can be a bit of a mismatch and then they just keep, you know, almost looking and predicting for that negative information until it matches. And so it sort of keeps them in that state. And part of what cognitive behavior therapy or mindfulness can do for people with meditation is it helps them to start doing some top-down positive prediction <laughs> so that uh, the brain can update that model and actually you know, see more of, of, of what's out there. And so sort of what I hear you talking about is um, you've done enough work to remove some of that top-down prediction such that your brain doesn't get caught off guard when there's a mismatch. There's, le there's just less room for mismatch in your inputs in the first place. And therefore what you're left with is uh, an experience that's more in line with the input if you wanna think about it that way. You know, and, and I, I think that sidesteps whether, side whether you're perceiving reality or not. I think sometimes that, that question sort of gets us into weird epistemological and ontological. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that is, uh definitely a tar ball. Right, but if you're just removing prediction and you are left with more of 
the input all the way through the system, uh, then I think that you could lead to some of these states that you're talking about. You have more room for pleasure because there's just less room for discontinuities in the system in the first place. And uh, ultimately, you know, you, you get this space for the system to just be available for whatever is present. Um, no. now, why, why that makes you feel good? I think that's still a, a big open question. Because, <laughs> you know, you could also say that makes you just feel nothing, right? So. Um, well, that's my point. The primordial feel good might be actually out there in nature. Yeah. It's called free energy change, <laughs> spontaneity. Mm -hmm. That's nature feeling good. <laughs> um, but this brings two really big questions. And I guess we're gonna have to leave it open. My first is, did you read the Friston article you sent me about does predictive coding have a future? Did um, you almost, yourself read almost it? Almost all the way through it. Yeah, yeah. Started reading it. I have, I've skimmed it. Um, it's amazing to me. Uh, did you agree or did you see problems with it as a scientist? Uh, I agree with the basic principle. I mean, you know, predictive coding is a theory and it's probably going to be overturned, but I think the basic notion that the visual system all the way up to the brain is learning from past experience and making predictions about that so it can figure out what to do. You know, that's that basic framework seems right. The active inference, what he would call active inference. Right. So here's my thing about that. It's often... So I'm wondering, active. So what does it do for active? Well, uh, it can actively look at a different piece, you know, turn my eye this way or that way so I get a different view. Um, but it could also actively have my hand reach out and I move the object. Um, one of those, well, they both, I guess, involve motor, but one of them's a little closer to the sensory, right? One's pretty far away, but both of those could be part of uh, a top-down uh, active uh, action, right? Mm -hmm. Am I correct Certainly. in that? Yep. Now, also part of active, uh, could it, since you're trying to get it to agree with the model, can we show how this causes errors in logic by you making, forcing it to agree with the model when in fact it shouldn't agree with the model? Shinzen, this is exactly what we're trying to find in the sensory clarity study. <laughs> this is what we've been talking about in our private meetings is when you reduce this, can you actually see things more clearly, literally? And that's our uh, test. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. I, I think uh, so. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. You know, uh, it, my dissertation was actually on whether your memory is helping your visual system decide what's out there, right? And that's a very, very deep and complicated problem. Um, for example, there's been studies that show that kids who are from lower socioeconomic status see a coin bigger than kids from rich, than rich kids, right? So poor kids see the same coin as bigger than rich kids. It's bit, this is a controversial finding, but so, so I'm not gonna say this is true or not, but it gets at this notion that what you are seeing is an active participation and active inference between what the brain is doing and what the input is. You're not looking at the world, you're looking at what the brain is presenting you given the input. And so, yes, I think the more time you spend reducing inference and just trying to be with what's in the input, you're probably getting closer to the input. Now, again, sidestepping all these questions about reality. Uh, but yes, I think, 
you know, the, the notion then, the hypothesis of her being scientists here would be, let's take some poor kids and some rich kids, train them to look at their visual inputs and train their visual systems. Do they now start seeing the coin as the same size? That would be a straight up prediction. And we could do something like that. So my other point is to report on my own subjective experience as the result of our ultrasound over low these many years now, since we've been, Jay and I have been uh, <laughs> boldly going with our own brains where very few human beings have ever gone <laughs> uh, in terms of acoustic energy. Um, I would say that the general effect of all the ultrasound we've done has been on me, has been that the sense that something needs to be taken care of in this moment somewhere that sense, something needs to be taken care of somewhere in this moment by me, meaning the top. Um, I'm wondering if that's not my perception of mismatch, error uh, coming up. The change that the ultrasound and the meditation have seemed to cause is that my immediate reaction to that now is I don't need to do anything despite getting that message because in about five seconds, the depths are going to solve it for me. So I just wait for this subliminal tsunami to pass through that just seems like space expanding and contracting. And after it does, I have the perception whatever that thing was that needed to be fixed has been fixed for me. So I think it has something to do with how we're turning over control, but in the right way for the, the good robot to sort of take over and uh, nature is living through us. So that's some questions to explore. You know, it's interesting, Shenzhen. I was thinking as you're talking, my experience of hearing you talk reflects exactly what you're saying, which is that I think I notice that people just get this kind of delighted grin when you talk a lot. And I think it's because of the inner spontaneity and free freeness that you have is reflected in your speech. And it's delightful. There's something pleasurable about experiencing that spontaneity, even in, in someone's speech. Like there's, there is, I feel effectively what you're talking about, about that freedom, both you're conveying it in words, but I'm also experiencing it through your words at the same time, which is really delightful. <laughs> yep, totally agree with that. I get to talk to Shenzhen almost every day, and I get to just yeah, but I get to talk to, to Jay that. Sanguinetti anytime I want. And the little eight year old boy gets to talk to a real grown up scientist anytime he wants. <laughs> That's why what I feel could like be better than that? 
Oh, I, well, thank you, Shenzhen. I, I think the pleasure is, is mine. In that sense, I, I wake up some mornings and go, oh my God, I get to talk to Shenzhen today. <laughs> yeah, but me too. It's like, oh my God. Uh, you know, I, I think I, uh, I think adjoint, I think adjoint cylinders are the answer. And I can ask Jay. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was going to say one one thing that we sort of got sidetracked, but Chelsea, I think your original podcast, number one, when you were talking about the sense of self and what is that and how do we talk about it, how do we quantify it, I think that that gets right to the core of what you're talking about, Shenzhen, that what you've somehow been able to do and what the long-term practitioners are doing is maintaining motivation within the system. So the curiosity piece relates to motivation, I think. While removing the thing that evolution evolved to motivate us, which is this egoic self. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, it's, that's it just trick. seems, I never would have thought that the subconscious could do math, <laughs> actual math. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, it does. And you know who said so? Whitehead. Mm -hmm. Alfred North Whitehead said that the goal of mathematical of mathematics is to provide us with a notation whereby everything goes on autopilot. We don't have to think at all. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, these conversations you and I have recently, they all are coming from that. Uh, mm -hmm. They're just, it just seems like the depths know how to be a creative scientist now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the trick. It's not to say that Shenzhen has no ego or self, but it, you know, the reason I was bringing up this analogy with visual objects is that the less solidity you have, the more fluidity you have in the system. They call that dynamical state changes in the, in the brain sciences. And I think that's what we're seeing here. That's when Chelsea's bringing up gamma and all these altered states that relate to gamma. What the brain is doing is it's having more dynamical states and less fixed states all the way into whatever we're calling the sense of self and how it's organizing that. And if you can do that in a stable way, such that you're not just like tripping out on psychedelics all day, but now you're this integrated human being with uh, a fuzzier self, not no, you know, you, you have to have a self in some sense or an ego to drive a car and things like that. But you're somehow doing a figure ground reversal on the self. You know, you're going from I am the self to something else that's aware of that as an object in the senses or, or in the system. That I, there's something around that. I think you're right, Chelsea. And we don't, you know, I'm struggling to even talk about it now, but that system is being modulated. That's been my own experience. And then when I look in the brain science and try to figure out like what the heck is actually going on here, um, it has something to do with those systems related to Shenzhen and the way information's flowing and the way it's congealing or not congealing within the system. And uh, yeah, we're getting there. We're, you know, we're at, uh, we're at 1% of the science. So <laughs> that's what, what makes this so much fun. Yeah, and the, the thing I was thinking so much while you two were talking is about the process of this occurring as well. So if, if you think about these two types of pleasure that we talked about, one is this evolutionary pleasure of wanting to go towards something that would benefit the separate self and go away from something that wouldn't, and the feeling that Shinzen talks about of needing to fix something, needing to do that, to sort of attain that. That's one type of pleasure. And then there's this other deeper free pleasure, this delight that's fluid, Right. And then with the predictive coding as well, you would have the initial predictive coding that's, you know, I'm a separate self. I have this relationship to this person and these things are very specific. And then as you move through degrees of freedom, I would imagine that your predictive coding would change by degree too. Right. It's not that you would go from having everything be a very strong top down control to total freedom. In fact, your top down processing would likely reconfigure repeatedly and that the, the act of transitioning from one type of pleasure to the other, as well as the progressive reconfiguration of that top-down processing, I would imagine that that is what spiritual integration consists of, really, is, and the success to which we can do that stuff 
would dictate the things you say about how functional can we be as we become fluid and some sort of negotiation or reconfiguration of those systems in a successful way. You know, if you want to live in the world and not just go off and be in a cave, in which case it doesn't really matter if you're tripping on psychedelics all day and, uh, <laughs> right. But, um, but yeah, I mean that, that I always think about that integration piece and, um, how to successfully manage that. But so, yeah. Totally. I, yeah, I would say that whatever is creating a sense of self is changing its prediction codes about the inputs. So, you know, as, as you're looking at this visual object, if you're looking at the video, it's an illusion in a sense. This is not what it actually is. It's some quantum foam stuff that's happening. And, you know, the dimensionalities are completely different, but you see this thing and something in the system is, is grabbing onto that or not. It's sort of, there, there's this sort of systems among systems that are all sort of congealing around each other. And somehow you're changing the relationship between those in a way that feels free. And that, that relationship change leads to this deep, deep sense of pleasure. And yeah, I think the quality of research guys, uh, people are really on to why that might be the case. You're, you're changing the geometry of your conscious experience. You know, our friend um, Roger Penrose will like the word geometry there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm thinking there might, I want there to be something to all that. His um, uh, twister space formulation, that's geometry, right? Mm -hmm. And it's highly abstract geometry, but it's still geometry. And um, I think there may be something to it. I think, I hope we can make Fristonian physics relevant to, um, that would be a nice thing <laughs> for uh, Roger's ideas about the Pythagorean program. <laughs> I hope so. You know, I, my intuition about a lot of these big problems that you guys are bringing up, especially <laughs> Chelsea, is the answers are quite different than we think. Um, and I think that's also really important in, in both brain sciences and, and thinking about contemplative sciences. I very much agree that phenomenology, so relating experience to the brain stuff is very, very important. Um, but also within the context that the question of consciousness and self is fundamental. You know, it, it we know so little about it, for example, that it could be the case that everything is conscious, right? That the world that we're interacting with is made of this stuff that we're trying to talk about and that energy is emerging from that and matter is emerging from that, right? That's a, a scientifically possible position. It's not, you can't test that at the moment, but you know, that's a possibility that we can't, you know, some people actually entertain that as truth. So, you know, I think also we have to keep that open. We're, we're trying to reduce it down to gamma waves and things like that. But, you know, the, the actual model may be so different than the, what the current scientific models are able to entertain. And again, that motivates me. That's, that's such a fascinating thing about the whole sciences, right? It, it could be, you know, something more like Krishnamurti is saying yeah. that the observer is the observed, right? That something totally different is going on out there. To that level of degree in which case this consciousness which is a property of physics in a sense could also contain or be the same as bliss or pleasure and the human nervous system could be transducing this the same way that we transduce light sound and anything else so it could be that our brains are actually picking up this property from around us in some manner which is a thing that as you say cannot be tested but it's so uh, delightful as an idea <laughs> So delightful. Right. And we can be well, open to it at the moment. So that's that's the fun part about it. See, see, my take on Friston is, and once again, this is way out of my uh, pay grade to comment on scientifically. But what I hear him saying is 
forget about falsifiability. Uh, it's, it's a non-issue. What the issue is, uh, or te even testability in a certain sense, the issue is we can use free energy to model system A. And we could use free energy to model system B. And system A might be um, a novel. And system B might be a infusorium little uh, one cell animal inside a larger internal ecosystem, inside a larger internal ecosystem. Completely different things that one's a novel someone wrote. And one is this complicated nested. But if we apply the same formality, um, to both systems, we get a description in a common language. They're obviously completely different critters. We start to argue ontology, philosophy, well, be my guest. But rather, let's just say, can we measure the degree to which each of these systems follows the free energy principle. If we can measure that, we don't have to make comments on what the systems are. We can describe the systems and we can say, and we can, the thing we can measure is the degree to which these systems are obeying this principle. And then we can compare the systems because we've got something to compare them uh, you know, uh, to. So we bypass the philosophically gnar gnarly uh, Karl Pop Popper thing about, well, it doesn't mean you, it's impredicative. You haven't said something if it can't be falsified, who, who makes those fucking rules? But we, want, we have to have <laughs> rules. We have to have rules. Unless I'm wrong, what Friston is saying, forget about that criterion. Yeah. Can we measure with standard math in the physical world, the degree to which these systems are this other system, this model system, mm -hmm. that to me sounds like very uh, responsible scientific claim. Mm -hmm. this, this Jay, what do you think? Uh, do I have it right? I, I might have misread him. This is what I think he says to the people that say, well, you can't prove it with an, an experiment, I, I so you can't say that. I haven't read Friston talking about that, so I'm not sure I can comment. But hey. um, this is this is going to be for the next podcast for sure. The philosophy of science, but the sh the short comment is you're right. And falsifiability is one way to think about science, and definitely not the only way to do science. Uh, science is not a fixed thing, you know, like anything in nature. I think, but I think the key in science is updating your beliefs with data, and you don't have to use a falsifiability framework to update your beliefs with data. Um, you can do it other ways. The, the Bayesian framework is another way to update your beliefs. There's not much about falsifiability really in that. It's just updating based on experience. And so I think you're totally right. I think there's multiple ways to do this. And that was sort of my comment to Chelsea too, is stay open. You know, if, if we get, if we start grasping on to certain ideas and thinking like this is something fundamental to the system, um, we're, we're going to miss out on what else is present here with what we're talking about and all the other possibilities 
to the point where we could be so thinking about this wrong that we've got the, the dire directionality of matter wrong, <laughs> which is exciting to me if that's really what's going on in science. So yes, I think that's totally possible as long as you're somehow updating what you're talking about based on experimentation or there's other ways to do that, just gathering the data and letting the system update. That's what I love about scientists. Once I started getting to know scientists, the really good scientists are really fluid and really open and really unfixed in their position. I mean, not all scientists are. Some are super, um, super fixed and, and just get more and more fixed all the time. But the, the ones that you meet that are that are not are, are delightful. And they have actually that same quality that Shinzen talks about with that spont spontaneity, freedom, and openness to to seeing things that weren't there before, which is, it, it's a similar, I think when done, when done in a way that appeals to me, it produces a similar personality, which is, which is wonderful. It also reminds me of what I talked to you about in our first conversation ever, Jay, where you were talking about, maybe we don't need to understand these larger questions about what is consciousness, but we just need to figure out what principle it is, whether it's equanimity or fluidity or whatever, and you don't think it's as complicated as we think it is, but it, like Shinzen is saying, there's probably just something that you could observe that is happening in the brain. And we don't need to answer why or how or what, but if we could measure it, we could see how much equanimity people have and in what areas, you know, is it in the subcortical structures? Is it in this area of the cortex or that? And be able to actually help people to get some of it, which I think is the most, appealing part of all of this for me at least is um, helping people, which um, it seems like you guys are on, on track to doing, which is exciting to me. Hope so. <laughs> yeah, I would say there's, there's a role for both types of scientists and there's not, there's not one way to do science. You know, as you move up in an experience with science, you realize that what you're trying to study the actual phenomenon is in motion. Everything is moving, everything is changing. And in science, we're trying to take a snapshot and study it and measure it. But as soon as you've done that, the thing that you're studying has moved on to something else <laughs> and it's changing and dynamic and part of systems of systems. So, you know, as you, as you do science, you realize that all of these problems, it's not just psychology and neuroscience, but all of these problems are these dynamic and fluid systems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and another principle I think that, that I follow in science uh, that comes more from my philosophy of science is that simplicity is probably the direction you want to go in. The more simplistic your theories are, um, the more that you'll probably be able to describe, actually. And so, you know, when I think about brain function, when I think about equanimity, when I think about the things that Shenzhen's talking about, uh, the answers are, are highly complicated right now, how the brain, how 100 billion neurons or 86 billion neurons are interacting and oscillating and coordinating their activity. But they may be doing that with one basic algorithm. It may just be one algorithm across the whole brain <laughs> and equanimity when, is when that uh, algorithm I, changes. <laughs> and I'm hoping that algorithm um, can be modeled um, with a... Uh, Fristonian two category. <laughs> you have to go up. Even regular category theory is not abstract enough. You have to go to a, a second order category. Wait, hold on. Isn't Friston the most complicated math ever? That's uh, no, so no. Complicated that you can't Fritz, Friston's it. math. <laughs> Friston's math is the, is just. <laughs> Don't get me on that. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> no, well, people have said Friston's idea is so simple, it's obvious. That's, that's the problem with Friston, actually. Oh, really? I heard the other way. Some of my physicist friends were saying that it's so complex that no math, mat very few mathematicians can actually understand it or something. No, like he, doesn't, he doesn't make it easy. I will say that. Mm -hmm. the math, he makes sure. no effort to make his math, math easy. And you have to dig, but he, and he also assumes you're very familiar with all the literature, which most of us aren't. <laughs> um, but 
his math is the math every scientist should know. Uh, if math education was not so backward, uh, you know, to get an engineering degree in Europe, just an engineer's degree to do practical shit, but a degree, you have to have at least learned functional analysis. That's not the most advanced calculus, but that's way beyond what most engineers in the US have never even heard of functional analysis, what to say of actually have used it. But my European engineer friends, I'm just saying, I've got an idea to apply higher dimensional abstract algebra to Friston. And I don't think anyone's done that yet. Um, so I'm planning on a math. If you think the math is opaque now, wait till I'm done with it. Uh, this morning's idea is a second order category. Um, and then finding natural equivalences. So it's a functor, it's, it's a, a, a two functor between, uh, or a, yeah, a two functor between second order categories uh, might be the ultimate thing that everything does. And the, this, they, would be Friston uh, dyads. That's what I'm working on. And then we'd use um, adjoint cylinders to bring in uh, yin-yang dialectical philosophy. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm planning on making Friston's math incomparably more <laughs> Steep. That's my plan. But in order for that to work, my understanding has to be right. And I'm not at all convinced that I even understand it. But I got big plans for math. <laughs> uh, Jay, you want to tell them what a Hegelian taco is? <laughs> I was going to wonder. I was wondering if you were throwing in the Hegel talk, Hegelian taco into this equation. <laughs> Jay knows what a Hegelian taco is. Very few people in the world have ever tried to munch on a Hegelian taco. But I will tell you. I hope I can bring Bill Lavier, who is a still living pioneer in category theory. His ideas of cohesive infinity one topos and adjoints, uh, how to make Hegel into sharp, and I mean sharp mathematics. If he can do that with Hegel, I can do that with Buddhism and Taoism. And it's the same process, but that's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> tell. Tell the world what a Hegelian taco is. Uh, unfortunately, I have another call coming up. And I okay. Have to, <laughs> that's have a cliffhanger. I think that's technically a cliffhanger. Look, I, I will tell you where to find the answer. Probably the only place in the world, but NCAT lab. <laughs> that's the website. That's where the category, some very, very grown up mathematicians talk to each other there at NCAT lab, and you can find the Hegelian taco. But be warned, this is, uh, you need major geek purity to dare enter this castle. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> well, Wow, amazing. Shinzen Chelsea and Dr. Jay Sanguinetti, really wonderful. Such an incredible conversation. Thank you. I'm not sure if it's done. It seems like there's cliffhangers upon cliffhangers. Maybe it's cliffhangers all the way down rather than turtles all the way down <laughs> in this podcast. But so wonderful. Um, I, I would love to continue this conversation maybe in a, in a couple of months. I know you're all very busy, so the chances are slim, but I'm just going to put it out there. 
uh, into the quantum soup and so on and see what happens. But oh, so wonderful. Thank you all three of you for uh, just a totally thrilling conversation. Mm, thank you guys. I adore all of you and so, so delightful to talk. So delightful. Yeah, thank you. This was awesome. And I definitely hope we can continue. We, uh, I, I think like the last couple episodes, Shenzhen took us into new dimensions. And, you know, I had lots of stuff that I was hoping to bring up as well. So I'd love to talk about the next few. That's what oh, I was sure. afraid of. I really <laughs> wanted. No, it's great. I think it's, I think this is beautiful. And that's why I love this podcast. It really just lets you open up to the possibilities. So thank you. Yeah, if, if we do another one, we should have Jay lead the discussion because I want to hear these ideas that he hasn't had a chance to talk about. And then, and then Shinsen and I can just chime in. And, yeah, that sounds know, like a great plan. I love that idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Shinsen Young, Chelsea Fasano, and Dr. Jay Sanguinetti. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Shinsen. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.